Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are meeting and pay my respects to elders both past and present. Uh, welcome tonight to the 10th of August Central Coast Council uh, Ordinary Council meeting. And I will now declare the meeting open. And uh, first, up in line with the public health orders and the stay at home requirements, we've had a significant impact on how we work and function in our daily lives. So until such time that requirements are lifted, council meetings will be held remotely and the public can attend uh, by way of the webcast. So operating council meetings sometimes are a little challenging and you may see from time to time that we are in contact with staff or talk, staff are talking. And this is just normal and part of uh, helping us uh, give some better support to the overall meeting. I'd remind you that uh, webcast, uh, this meeting is being webcast and not that we have any, but if you were participating in the meeting, uh, just to remind you that uh, your image and what you say is being recorded. So as is typical, I'm going to start by just talking a little bit about what's been going on in council in the recent times. And I think the first thing, which unfortunately is still extremely topical is COVID. So council is still continuing to monitor and responding to the advice that uh, is provided by the New South Wales government. Uh, as well as evolving changes to the public health orders in place to try and control the spread of COVID-19. Just a reminder to all those who are listening that restrictions do remain in place across Greater Sydney, including the Central Coast, Armadale, Newcastle, Lake Macquarie, Maitland, Port Stephens, Singleton, Dungog, Musselbrook, Cessnock and Tamworth. Several announcements were made over the weekend and yesterday a large number of COVID-19 exposure sites across the coast have been identified. If you have attended any of these exposure sites, please follow the health orders, self-isolate it and get tested. And just make sure you check the New South Wales government website regularly as the lists of the venues of concern and the relevant health advice is being updated continuously as investigations proceed. New South Wales Health is the responsible agency who can provide the most timely and up-to-date advice. If we just look at one of the major sites, which is the Lake Munmora Public School Exposure Site, that's also been updated. Anyone who attended the school between 26th of July and 4th of August 2021 is now considered a close contact, must get a COVID-19 test and isolate for 14 days, regardless of what the test result is. So I do implore the community to remain diligent uh, when moving about if you need to leave home for essential reasons. Mask up. Check in and keep your distance as community health is everybody's responsibility. But equally important, keep an eye out for each other. We've been very, very good at that up in the Central Coast, but make sure we keep it up. Uh, we all cope differently in such circumstances. So please be patient with one another. Uh, as far as business is concerned, we fully understand you're struggling in, this, in these times, but what is available is up on the Service New South Wales website and there are programs which you can avail yourself of. So this is all about keeping yourself and the community safe for the future. On to more positive stuff, I just want to congratulate our local Olympians. Um, it's an outstanding performance uh, for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, and you have made our community proud. And a special shout out must go to Nicola McDermott for her outstanding uh, result in getting both an Australian record and uh, a silver medal at the Olympics. And apart from that, she's an amazing and very professional uh, and gorgeous young lady. Census tonight, and reminder, you must fill in your census form tonight. This is a national survey. It's only completed once every five years, and it provides a lot of data for various government agencies over the next period to actually uh, try and tailor services and uh, know how much money they need to spend when they know where exactly the population is and so on. So we also use this information to plan and deliver some of our services, facilities and programs. So we encourage everybody to complete the survey and be included in this year's census so that council can better serve you as, uh, as a resident. So kind of what's been going on in council? Well, I know most of you, or some, at least a lot of you, have already received your rates notice. And uh, probably just under half of you are relatively happy and just over half of you are not very happy. Now, my office alone has received over 80 emails, and I can assure those who have written into my office uh, will receive a written response uh, in the uh, future. And the consistent concern is that people say we've increased the rates by more 
than the 15% special rate variation that IPART granted us. Um, now, I'll just try and explain it very simply as to why the rate increase does or is a lot higher for Gosford re residents. The first thing to take into consideration is that Wyong, back in, I think it was around 12, uh, 2013 um, or 2012, somewhere around there, actually put in a rate increase, uh, which of course has been in existence uh, for three years out of the four years that it was planned for. And that still continues through to this day. The Gosford community was talking about uh, doing this, but didn't unfortunately do it. So if you like, uh, Gosford residents have been benefiting for nearly the next last decade in terms of not having a true reflection of what their uh, services uh, that have been provided to them and what they cost. Bear in mind that Gosford at the time of the merger had no working capital at all uh, compared to Wyong, which had some. So you can see even in that, that the Gosford was well and truly overdue for getting more revenue in. So that's the first thing. The Gosford Council was well behind. So with, harmon <clears throat> with harmonisation, we have to have one rating system for the whole of the Central Coast Council. That means when you combine the two together, before we do the 15%, we actually have Wyong residents coming back uh, a bit and we have Gosford residents going up quite a bit. Um, and bear in mind, for the last uh, four years, uh, Wyong residents have been subsidising those Gosford residents because they hadn't had a rate increase on an average basis of around $180 a year. Uh, so that harmonisation has taken place and that has forced uh, Gosford rates up higher and faster than, uh, than in fact, uh, Wyong rates have gone up. The second thing is that the residential property values, in other words, the land value done by the value of general, which is what how much that the value of your property does determine how much you pay in rates. In Gosford, um, whether you consider it lucky or not, uh, but I would consider it lucky because your asset has risen in value, but your property values have gone up 27% uh, more than Wyong. So again, you've got another whammy on top of the harmonisation, you've actually got the change in the um, valuations adding to it. Now, on top of that, we have applied the 15% rate increase. So it's only the 15%, that's all that goes on the, on, onto the rate once we've calculated, once we've harmonised, taken into consideration the value of the properties and changes in the value of the properties. On top of that new value, we've put 15% on everybody's rates. So that's why they've gone up higher. Now, <clears throat> Now, uh, we have just done some comparisons recently, and following the 15% rate increase, uh, when comparing against other local government areas around us, we still remain one of the lowest in terms of the ordinary rate charges with average residential rates of $1,268. Now, for the minimum rate, which applies to apartments and so on, is $565. Um, now, when you compare the 1268 and the 565 to, for example, Cessnock, it has no minimum rate, and their average rate is uh, 1,890. Lake Macquarie's basic rate is 1,519, and their base amount or their minimum rate is 760. Uh, Newcastle is 1,614, the base amount. Uh, or minimum rate is 807. The mid coast is 1418. And Northern Beaches, just to give a comparison for my area, uh, the average rate is 1524. And the minima, minimum is just under 1000. So you can see, even with the 15% applied, uh, the uh, Central Coast has and still is getting a pretty good deal um, for their rates. So hopefully, uh, people have been able to understand why the rates do appear a lot higher from the Gosford community. And as I said, we haven't had a complaint from any of the Wyong community as of yet. And just to remind you that we do understand that some of the ratepayers will be having, uh, having difficulties, perhaps particularly at this particular time, and may be struggling. So we do have a hardship uh, policy. It's on our website and we do offer assistance. So a hardship arrangement is a payment arrangement for a maximum nine months duration, and that's excluding pensions. They have their own system. Now, payment arrangements over a longer period, past the nine months, can be arranged, but you must have a formal hardship application. 
And for further information on this, please go to the uh, Council's Hardship Policy, which is on our website. Again, uh, some quite slightly other more important, uh, I, well, not necessarily more important, but sort of more interesting and uh, good news is that uh, we have a water outages map. So Council's brand new interactive water service interruptions map is now live. So this map does display the real-time updates on water outages, emergency works, and planned maintenance. Our community can see at a glance what water issues are affecting their area, the severity of the issue, estimated completion date and time of works, and any other details of the outage, just by clicking on it. So well done to the teams who work collaboratively on the project. This is a great example of some of our teams always looking for new ways to service and inform the coast community. We've also uh, commenced uh, some of our knowledge and construction works. So works on the uh, shared pathways at Tuggerawong, Foreshore and Umina Beach, Woi Woi Wharf construction, road up grades at Coca Cabana and Saratonga Toga, uh, have resumed. And council continues to deliver uninterrupted essential waste collection, resource recovery and disposal services to our community with safe COVID protocols in place. Some of the things that I've been trying to do uh, well, in, in this time, it's, it's not easy to, because you can't actually get about and, of course, uh, have not been uh, allowed to basically travel around the area at all. So following the council resolution uh, a couple of weeks ago, the CNI, sorry, two meetings ago, the CEO and I have met with IPART via uh, electronic communications on the 27th of July. Uh, at that meeting, uh, we were introduced to the new um, chair. It's a new chair who's taken over. And uh, we met with the, the chair and talked through some of the issues. So we were appraised her of our current situation. Uh, she was very gentle in reminding us that uh, IPART are a totally independent organisation and that we certainly couldn't uh, you know, persuade them to do anything with our discussion. But what I hoped we could do is we could leave them with the, the strong understanding of what our current situation is and the difficulty that it has placed us under uh, by only giving us three years of guaranteed uh, income at the current rate. And uh, we talked about the proposals as to how we might move forward from there. The public inquiry um, has uh, just released the list of the people who have uh, made submissions. Um, I put a submission in, so I think I was number four on the list. Don't ask me why it's high, because I didn't put it into the last day, so everybody else must have been very late in putting theirs in then. But uh, there's a total of about 97 submissions, um, and the Commissioner will be contacting members of the public and staff and people like myself uh, in preparation for interviews, which we understand will take place in the first and last weeks of September, and they will be conducted online, probably, um, but they will certainly be done under safe COVID uh, situations. Um, I've continued to meet with key stakeholder groups and members of the community. And uh, again, I've met remotely with representatives from the Hardy Bay community groups to discuss various issues in their local community. I also had with me uh, electronically uh, a couple of the executives. Uh, we were able, and we were able to talk through some of the issues that they have at this point in time, not necessarily provide all the answers, but uh, I'm looking forward to actually being able to visit out there uh, once uh, I'm able to do so. Uh, I've also had an online meeting with uh, Donna Rygate. She is the chair of the uh, local planning panel. And I, I just had a, want to have a conversation with her because clearly uh, the planning panel is a very important part of, of the process in terms of granting DAs and so on. And <clears throat> I, I did want to find out how our kind of the fact that we've had to downsize a bit, how that was impacting upon them. And she did admit that uh, we weren't quite as fast as uh, we have been and that uh, our support to the panel uh, wasn't quite as good as it also has been. Now, she understood exactly the reasons why, which is the fact that we've had to cut the cloth quite severely in order to uh, be able to continue our way forward and also to be able to satisfy the conditions of the uh, loans and so on uh, that we've been able to, to obtain. The referendum, in line with the Minister for Local Government's decision to postpone local government elections, the referendum for Central Coast Council will not be proceeding on the 4th of, uh, of the 4th of uh, September. Um, and I note that uh, a paper will be coming back uh, advising us what's, what is the way forward for here. What I can say to the community is that I, we will be carrying out the referendum. It's just a question of trying to work out how and when we can do that, given these uh, change, in, uh, change in times 
and the impacts of various other elections, including the state election down the track. So that sort of concludes uh, my comments for, for tonight on terms of things we've been doing. Uh, I note that there's been no people received or wanting to talk at the open forum, so there's no requests, so we will pass on with that. In terms of the public forum, I also note that there are no requests to speak uh, from residents. So we don't have any speakers tonight, which I find unfortunate. And for those who are lifting out there, we actually do welcome people participating in the meetings. I know it's not the same as coming along and being able to chew the fat um, and sort of eyeball people and see their body language and so on. And I certainly don't find it easy either, but uh, it is there, the opportunities are there. And I would ask you to avail yourselves of those opportunities and, and try and participate in the meetings. Um, because hopefully, you know, there is things that there might interest you, and it's, it's absolutely the right thing to do to ask questions or give your views about things. That's part of the democracy that we want to operate in. So I'm going to move along with the with the council meeting now, and uh, we'll like take item 1.1, which is disclosures of interest. I don't have any interest to disclose. I don't believe any of the directors have any interest to disclose. They're all shaking their heads. So. We will now resolve to adopt the resolution that is shown on the screen, and uh, we'll move to item 1.2, which is the confirmation of the minutes of the previous meeting. And I'm quite happy to confirm the meetings of the previous meeting, so I now resolve to uh, adopt the resolution that is displayed on the screen. Item 1.3 is notice of intention to deal with matters in closed session. We do not have any matters to discuss in closed session this time, and therefore um, I ask the council to adopt the, or receive the report and adopt the um, recommendation as shown on the screen. I'm now going to move to an administrator's minute, but I'm not gonna read the whole thing out, and it has to some extent been circumvented, but I think it's still important that we put our views forward to the government. They have placed a hold on it, um, the draft bill, I understand, has been uh, uh, held back, but it is on the Environmental Planning and Assessment Infrastructure's Contributions Bill 2021. Now, that bill has been introduced to try and help simplify, and there are some very good things about uh, the bill that's been put in place, um, and it's been subject, as I said, to the parliamentary inquiry, which I think has uh, uh, asked that it not go forward. And the Bill proposed legislation that enabled the implementation of recommendations from the New South Wales Productivity Commission, uh, which when they reviewed the infrastructure's contributions, that's the sort of 7-Eleven or the old section uh, 94 or whatever they were, however on closer scrutiny um, to this bill, there were some fish hooks with them. So we do want to provide those, what we believe to be the fish hooks, which I have to say the large majority of councils have also uh, seized upon. So those contributions are an important part of uh, our revenue stream, and those funds do go towards helping uh, contribute to infrastructure uh, from the, you know, that uh, is required to keep up to date with some of the developments that do take place. So that's sort of roading, drainage, and other things like that, more parks, more libraries, or adding on to libraries and so on. So unfortunately, a lot of these contributions do also place a burden on local government, um, simply because we don't always get enough money uh, to actually do some of the jobs that we need to do. And if it's not spent immediately, then of course the money tends to lose value, the longer it stands inside a bank account, and consequently never can completely fund what we want to do. So it's one of the reasons why councils tend to build up very large reserves in their restricted res reserves of these contributions. So <clears throat> under the modelling um, conducted by the, um, the Productivity Commission, they believe the reforms would uh, benefit the councils, but council modelling, uh, not by us, but also by local government New South Wales and other councils, uh, tends to suggest there may be occasions when we're disadvantaged. So I won't go through all of those, um, but um, you know, just one, one example might be that um, the permanent deferral of infrastructure contributions to the time of occupation certificate rather than the time of approval. Now, that was a temporary measure implemented by, for the pandemic, but of course it means we don't get the money till quite a bit later. And we need the money early on to be part of our planning. Uh, and as I said, the money loses value from the day it hits our bank account. Um, the other thing is that uh, they've, they've tied up the bill with the council rate peg. Now, they're two quite separate issues, and I haven't got time tonight to go into all the issues about the rate peg, 
but uh, they should actually be treated as separate issues. So they're just two of the reasons, but the other main reasons are in my, in my report. But I also want to highlight the broader issues that councils are continually faced with. I would have to say, the framework local government operates under is archaic, restricted and conflicting. There are many examples of this, but particularly one that's affecting us, which is pertinent to the, the, this paper, affecting the Central Coast Council, is the issue of funding for the depreciation and operational expenditure of infrastructure provided by contributions. And this is also further exacerbated by the state and Commonwealth providing us capital grants um, with gay abandon, I might add, and frequently these days, um, but very few operational grants. Now, the problem with all those grants is that we, it does not give us income to look after them into the future. So we can build something, but we can't look after it into the future. So, and the community also expects this new and improved infrastructure. So the net result of this, generally speaking across councils, is that they either have to go to IPART to apply for more, uh, you know, a rate increase to be able to pay for this new infrastructure, to pay for the operate, operate, operational side and the depreciation, or generally speaking, what they do, they just let that infrastructure backlog grow. In other words, they're passing the problem on to a future, future generation. Now, the, uh, that's what most councils do. They actually, they do, in fact, uh, if they're running short of money, they actually do then uh, uh, increase their backlog of infrastructure or their renewals. And we have to remember, basically, by, given, by being given money, it costs us. So there are no such things as free lunches. Now, the IPART regulatory impact, in my view, leads the community to believe that IPART controls council's expenditure. There's no question about that. They do. So, and the communities come to really think I rely on IPART to actually control council instead of holding their councillors and the management to account, just as what occurs in the real world or the private sector. And ultimately, in these situations, it's the community that gets penalised uh, by the decisions, not the organisation. So the financial situation Central Coast Council finds itself in is a clear example of the precarious position we are faced with when it comes to grant funding and trying to maintain financial sustainability. Our long-term financial plan sets the pass for the next 10 years with very little room to take on or match any grant funding that may become available. The council also now has to contend with the regulator, IPART, proposing to remove $25 million worth of revenue after three years, which makes a complete nonsense of our 10-year plan carefully put together to pay the monies that were unlawfully used, uh, used uh, from the uh, internally and externally restricted reviews. Reserves. So I'm of the view that the state government should be looking at the broader issues such as this, and there is one very, and this is one very important example that highlights the well overdue need for reform in local government. So we're attaching the uh, local government New South Wales submission, which is a much longer version and a very well written submission, I might add, uh, which does set out very clearly what the issues are uh, with um, going forward. So with that uh, minute, I'm going to move uh, formally move the. Uh, resolutions that are shown on the screen and move that as a decision of council. Now we'll move to, we only have four papers and uh, the first paper that's coming up is item 2.1, which is the draft Central Coast Disciplinary, Disability Inclusion Action Plan for 21 through to 25. And I'm going to ask, uh, Julie Vaughan, the Director of Community and Recreation Services, to just introduce uh, what this inclusion action plan is about, because my view of it, I think it's an extremely good plan, um, and I commend the officers for putting together something that I think is, is fabulous, uh, something that does, it's very, it reminds us all of the role that we all have to play in uh, contributing to, towards inclusion. So with that, I'll just ask Julie just to say a few words about it. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. Uh, the Disability Inclusion Act 2014 requires all public authorities, including councils, to have a disability inclusion action plan. Council's first four-year plan uh, finished at the end of June this year. 
Uh, the new draft Disability Inclusion Action Plan, which we're presenting this evening, will extend from 2021 to 2025 and has been informed by research and consultation with people living on the Central Coast with a disability, their carers and sector workers. In addition, Council's Access and Inclusion Reference Group um, played a significant part in the establishment of this document. It's drafted in accordance with the Disability Inclusion Act and the New South Wales Disability Inclusion Action Planning Guidelines. It presents presents a four year whole of council action plan um, that was developed to help us achieve the vision of a central coast that is accessible and inclusive place to play, visit, work and play. The draft plan um, as presented tonight is um, ready for public exhibition and it's proposed that that be exhibited from August 16th to the 13th of September and then reported back to council for adoption with any changes late October. So with that, Mr Administrator, I present that and recommend it be placed on exhibition. Yes, well, I think it's a great, great piece of work. It is only a draft plan at this stage, so certainly invite the community over the next 28 days to, to respond to it. Um, and I think just one question, uh, Ms Vaughan, I'm assuming that uh, this will be well um, conveyed across our whole organisation so that all plans in the future that we produce uh, will uh, you know, include the requirements that come out of this particular plan itself? Through you, Mr Administrator, yes, all um, unit managers in the respective um, sections have been um, consulted in the establishment of this and have included any relevant actions um, into current and future operational plans and accordingly budget. So um, the first document, as with this document, um, is a whole of organisation um, document. Uh, that's great. Well, I'm pleased to see it go out uh, on, on exhibition. So... With that, I'll, I'll move the uh, recommendations that are shown on the screen and put those down as a decision of council. Then we'll move to item 2.2, which is the draft responsible dog ownership policy for community consultation. Um, now, this, uh, this document I think is, uh, is a good one when we talk about how to look after dogs and so on, but I might have a couple of questions later on. Uh, Mr. Cox, I would like you to just uh, introduce this paper for our, our community members who are listening and uh, talk through what's actually the plan entails. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. Uh, and through you, uh, the Central Coast has the highest, the largest population of dogs in the state with approximately 143,000 registered animals. Um, and there's possibly a lot more that are unregistered that, that we don't know about as well. Um, and given our high rate of dog ownership, Council deals with thousands of inquiries each year relating to animal man management, uh, animal enforcement, uh, control and welfare. In addition, Council also impounds over 2,500 animals per year at its animal care facilities. To address these issues, enforcement alone um, will not provide the response we need from the community. We need a multifaceted approach to responsible dog ownership, which includes not only enforcement, as I said, but policy and education as well. In response, Council at its meeting uh, held on the 27th of April, 2021, resolved to develop the responsible dog ownership policy, which aims to define the expectations and responsibilities of dog owners, not only to their dogs, but also to the broader Central Coast community. A key theme and focus of the policy is your dog is your responsibility. And we want to strongly communicate that as a dog owner, you are responsible for ensuring that your dog does not impact the safety and well-being of the broader community or their animals. Um, the draft policy will be on exhibition for 28 days and we are seeking input from the community to ensure that the responsible dog ownership policy meets community expectations. Uh, thank you, Mr Cox. Uh, I look forward to the community's response to this document. Um, one thing I understand that we do, we also have a compliance uh, policy. Um, is that correct, Mr Cox? Uh, correct, Mr Administrator. Um, I, I think... It might be helpful if we actually, when, the, when this document comes back, uh, post-consultation, uh, that if the final document, um, as proposed, would include perhaps, you know, the attachment, if you like, of the compliance policy that would go with this. And so, as you, you've mentioned a couple of times, enforcement, it's what is the actual compliance and enforcement terms. I think there's our sections of the community that are quite keen to see what those entail, 
not just the how you look after your animal, which I think is very good, and the education I think is very good. But I think we do need to see all in one place just how the um, the, the enforcement and the, uh, the compliance takes place as well. So I can just ask you to do that when, when it comes back. That would be good. So will do, Mr. Administrator. Thank you. Um, so now I will uh, move on from that. Uh, as I said, it's a good draft document, and I look forward to the community again responding to uh, with commentary on that. So with that, I'll uh, resolve the uh, resolutions uh, that are shown on the screen. I'll pass that on as a uh, decision of council. And then we'll move to item 2.3, which is the Gosford Regional Library change of procurement method. Now, I have taken the liberty for the community to actually ask Ms. Bourne just to talk a little bit about uh, what the new regional library will look like. Uh, it is the one big single ticket item that we have taken on board uh, over the next uh, two or three years as far as the budgetary side goes. Um, I think it's a very exciting project. Um, and certainly when you look at some of the planning that's starting to come together or has come together for it, um, I think we can start to see it's going to be a great asset for uh, the Gosford uh, uh, area. So with that, uh, Julie, can you just talk us through what, the, what it looks like? And I believe you might have been able to manage to find a couple of diagrams there. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. Yes, I do. And with the support of meeting support, I will get them to assist me in um, doing a bit of a visual display. So um, the first image is a perspective image of the um, exterior of the facility. Um, and it's fair to say um, the, that libraries um, are more than just books. And today they play a much more contemporary role within communities offering a range of functions, um, places where people can meet, um, access technology, share and learn. Um, and that they um, help people in a range of com complexities of life. And whether that be, um, we assist people to apply for jobs, we um, provide programming and events, we navigate health systems for them and link them with housing and literacy. So um, people traditionally often think libraries are just about books, but as you'll see from what's proposed with this facility, um, it is intended that it will be a community space and a community hub. So the new regional library is will be a destination it will be 4,000 square metres and will include, um, and I'll talk you through the images that you can see on the screen once I've just given a high level overview. So it includes eight meeting spaces, a large multi-purpose function room that can cater for 300 people, exhibition spaces, dedicated local history space, council's customer service functions, an innovation space, or um, many people know that as a smart work hub, maker and creative spaces, study room and quiet room, access to public computers, high-speed Wi-Fi, high-speed Wi-Fi and collection in excess of 50,000 resources, including books, magazines, um, DVDs, etc. So as can be seen on the screen, um, you as you come into the library on the ground floor, um, there are areas for collections of newspapers and magazines. Um, we have the local history collection, which is um, immediately in front of you. To the right, to the left of the screen is um, Council's customer service um, facility. So that will be what you experience currently within the Council um, facility in Gosford. Um, we also have the children's reading play space area, um, as well as parents' rooms and um, toilet facilities, and the back of house function for Council's customer service staff and library staff um, sections. We then go up to the first floor and on the first floor is where the multi-purpose function room is, um, as well as a number of um, program and meeting spaces. So the multi-purpose function room, as I've indicated, can cater for up to 300 people, but will have the capabilities to be broken down into smaller um, spaces. And as has previously been reported to council, will also be able to host um, major functions, including um, the options for council meetings. There are two me um, meeting rooms slash program rooms available on this level as well as a range of flexible breakout spaces and a sound recording studio um, as well as um, you know uh, high level um, kitchen facilities for from a functions perspective we then go to the next level, which is um, primarily the innovation, which is, not, is on level two, which is the innovation um, space and smart work hub. So this provides um, 
uh, individual and open plan meeting uh, workspaces and stations, as well as meeting room and um, offices that will be available for um, hire from the community. So all levels of the facility um, are fully accessible and there are internal lifts. Um, and again, an, a range of um, breakout areas um, and networking opportunities for um, businesses and um, entrepreneurs. We then go up to um, level three, which is one of the main areas of um, the library function. So um, as can be seen here, um, what you would expect to see in a range of the functions, quiet rooms and study rooms and study booths, a range of research and um, internet computers are available, um, high level of uh, and um, availability of all of our um, materials for um, borrowing. Um, as well as some maker spaces and dry areas. Then the final um, level plan is um, what you'll see as being the roof. So I'm not sure as well, um, Sarah, if the image is also available. So that gives people a bit of a sense as to what it looks like. It's on the current park side um, site opposite the existing um, Gosford Library and next door to the um, ET Australia um, facility. So I will just recap on the funding source for this. So the total cost of that facility is $27,700,000. So, um, and it is a fully funded project. So there was an $8.1 million special rate variation that was um, collected during former Gosford Council's um, period um, that was offset by federal government funding of $7 million. There was um, sale proceeds of the old Kibbleplex building of $4.1 million, um, as well as $8.5 million from developer contributions. So the purpose of this evening's report, Mr. Administrator, is to seek approval to combine the demolition and construction DAs um, and to note the change of procurement me method from a single stage to a two stage process. So we've previously reported to council that that would be undertaken separately, but um, our, um, due to some of the complexities with the demolition um, of the existing building and site constraints, um, it requires some construction remediation works to be undertaken concurrently with the demolition. So that provides both um, prudent governance as well as obviously some cost efficiencies. Um, it will ensure that the successful contractor provide, pro possesses the adequate expertise to manage any um, eventuality and also prevent and disputes over any um, concerns that we may have. Um, the current designs are complete and ready for DA submission, which it's intended to submit that DA um, this week. Um, and that um, it's intended that we would then, um, obviously when we get to that tender stage, um, report back accordingly to council. So um, at this stage, the demolition, um, whilst it was originally proposed to commence separately and then um, in, as right now um, with construction to start um, next year, um, the revised timeframe is that um, demolition and then construction will follow that um, from March, 2022. So the new date for completion for the overall project is early 2024, which is um, about um, two months um, further on from what the very original proposal is, but consistent with what was reported a couple of months ago to Council. So with that, Mr. Administrator, um, we seek the um, approval to alter the procurement um, and note that we will be submitting the DA um, uh, this week um, and that will keep on consistent with the milestones um, in accordance with the funding body, but um, also keep on track for the completion and opening in um, April 2024. Thank you for that. Um, that is actually, I think, um, described it extremely well. It is far more than just a library. And I think that was one of the most important things that I picked up on when uh, I first learned of this project you know, a few months ago. So it's, it's great to see it finally coming in, in a sense to fruition. Um, just one question. Uh, Ms. Vaughan, I'm assuming that if we were to have sold the current building before this is completed, we would be making arrangements for continuation of some back of uh, some front of house services and so on uh, for the community in the interim period before this is up. 
Yes, uh, through you, Mr. Administrator, um, if there's any gap in particularly customer service functions, it's intended that they would be provided um, alternatively. But the intention is, as happens in a number of our libraries, is that the customer service functions would continue to operate and will be planned for this facility. So, so for, the, for this building then, and from a, the community's point of view, they'll actually be able to do just about everything that they were able to do previously uh, with the old administration building. The only difference will be that uh, the large group of staff that were in the, in the tower won't be there. They'll be based up in, in Wyong in the future. So from a community perspective, uh, they'll actually have better facilities, better access, um, nicer facilities, and they can also go and borrow a library book or, or look at other things there as well. So now, look, I think it's a fabulous uh, um, development, if you like, and uh, thoroughly uh, encourage the, um, you know, the putting in of the DA and getting the project underway. So... And I, for, having read the paper, and I understand uh, the reasons why you've gone for the two-stage procurement process, it makes absolute sense. Um, it uh, wouldn't work very well if you were trying to separate it just because of the recommendations of some of the engineers. So to comply really with the engineers undertaking, it makes awfully good sense to actually run the two together, still compliant with the Local Government Act. Um, so, yeah, look forward to how the market responds to the tenders. So with that... I'm going to uh, move the motions, the recommendations that are shown on the screen and uh, move those as a decision of council. And then we'll move on to item 2.4, which is the last paper. And that's just an amendment to the Central Coast Management Rights Procurement. Um, some time ago, we went out uh, to the market looking for the management rights for the stadium there, at uh, Central Coast Stadium in Gosford. Um, with the intention that we would seek to try and uh, um, get an external group to uh, operate and run it. Uh, In-house discussions uh, have suggested uh, in discussion with the union as well that uh, the in-house team that currently uh, runs the stadium, runs the venue, uh, would also be interested in putting in a bid. And I'm quite happy to allow that to take place. Uh, I'm familiar, uh, having come from New Zealand, but quite a number of the larger uh, consultancy companies that are around today actually came from this type of thing. So when a New Zealand changes were made and uh, councils had to outsource a lot of their uh, provision of services, uh, some large companies came out of that, sprung out of that, and one of the uh, New Zealand companies does operate over here and is one of the bigger players over here. Also in Victoria, the same thing came out of the compulsory competitive tendering process that uh, uh, Premier Kennett ran at the, when he did the local mergers there. Uh, also from there, uh, we've, they had to outsource 50% of their uh, current um, staff. Then, again, companies have sprung up out of that who do a very, very good job of managing things. So I think it's only reasonable to allow our staff to have a crack at it as well, which means just delaying the process. We've advised... Uh, other tenders, uh, other tenderers, and so on. That uh, that uh, this will be taking place. There will be an in-house bid, uh, but I can assure the community that the uh, the judgment of uh, who's successful will be done fully on a commercial basis and in the best interests of uh, securing the the, uh, the long-term venue uh, management rights. So, with that, um, I'm quite happy to do that. As I said, I think it gives those staff an opportunity. Uh, they are, they are experienced already. And, uh, but they have to put their best foot forward and they will be competing, no doubt, against some, uh, some good, strong players and major players out there. So I look forward to that um, and seeing the results of that. So with that, I'll uh, pass those uh, recommendations that are shown on the screen and uh, move those as a decision of council. And that brings us to the close of the, the meeting. Um, there's no more items to proceed with. So we can close the meeting at approximately uh, 6.14. Um, and uh, I wish everybody um, safe journeys, not physically moving around, but uh, safe journeys and whatever they're contemplating at the moment and also to, um, you know, stay safe throughout this period. And we've just got to tough it out and hopefully uh, there will come a day when life will return to some form of normality. But as someone asked me when I last said that, when is that going to happen? And I haven't got a clue. But anyway, good night, everybody, and uh, best wishes.